Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam with Historic Travels. And as always, before we get started today, I'd just like to take a quick moment to welcome all my new subscribers and to thank everybody who's leaving me comments and messages down below. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. And if you would like to take a couple extra steps to help support the Historic Travels YouTube channel a little bit more, there is a Patreon for that. There's a link in the description. Thank you guys, that's awesome. And in case you missed it, the merch store for the Historic Travels YouTube channel also went live. If you would like to check that out, there's another link for that in the description as well. And okay guys, so just a quick announcement before we get started on the video. This will be the final video in the Titanic series timeline covering all the events of the Titanic's crossing, you know, from when she left Belfast to the sinking and so on. Now, when it comes to the events after the sinking, you know, like the people in the water, the Carpathia, and all the events that, you know, go along with the Titanic story after the sinking, I'm going to make a separate series covering all of those events, and those will be their own video series that I'm going to work on at a later date. And for the series that I have just finished, uh, sometime next week, most likely, I am going to upload all of the episodes into one giant movie. So if you would like to go back and watch the entire timeline series of Titanic that I've been working on over the past month, you will have that option to do so. All right, everybody. Well, hey, I hope you've really enjoyed this series. This is the conclusion. This will be the final episode in the Titanic series timeline. And in this episode, we will be covering the last 10 to 15 minutes of the Titanic's life. And yeah, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this series. I hope you've learned a lot. I've had a ton of fun making it. And without any further ado, let's get into today's topic. It is now 2 a.m. on board the RMS Titanic on the morning of April 15, 1912. And remember, the RMS Titanic sank at 2.20 a.m., so the ship has roughly 20 minutes left before the ship finally sinks. Now, the crew that are still on board the Titanic, they realistically only have about 5 to 10 minutes left before the sinking of the Titanic becomes too unstable and they aren't able to work anymore. Now, at this late stage in the sinking, the RMS Titanic still has four lifeboats on board, collapsible A, B, C, and D. Collapsible A and B are on the roof of the officer's quarters by the Titanic's first funnel, and Collapsible C and D are located on the Titanic's side, currently being launched from the Titanic by the ship's davits. Now, I know in the last video we went into detail about how the crew barely had enough time to launch all the lifeboats on the Titanic before she went down, and honestly, they didn't have enough time to launch all the lifeboats. Remember, only 18 of the 20 lifeboats were launched. Now, I can understand why collapsible A and B on board the Titanic, those lifeboats, were not launched from the ship. I understand why they had to be floated off, because their position on the Titanic wasn't that easy for the crew to access. Collapsible A and B were located right beside the first funnel on the roof of the officer's quarters. So those lifeboats weren't easy for the crew to access. Now, when it comes to all 18 other lifeboats, the two lifeboats that are still on the ship at 2 a.m. that are still connected to the davits, those lifeboats were in a good position to be launched. All the other lifeboats on the Titanic were in a place where they could be easily accessed by the crew and launched. And it was still 2 a.m. before they managed to get all those lifeboats off. I mean, it's unbelievable, really. It, that just goes to show how hard the crew worked on the Titanic to get those 18 of those 20 lifeboats off of the Titanic. And as I said in the last video, I think the crew of the Titanic should get a lot of praise that night for doing what I consider to be the near impossible. Now the lifeboat you see in this animation getting ready to leave the ship is Collapsible C. Now as Collapsible C was being lowered away from the Titanic, this lifeboat was being launched from the Titanic's starboard side. However, due to the very sharp list that the Titanic had to port at this late stage in the sinking, the entire time that this lifeboat was being lowered away, this boat was literally grinding or rubbing against the hull of the Titanic, threatening to cause this lifeboat to capsize, spilling all of its occupants into the ocean. I mean, honestly, can you imagine how scary it must have been for the people in this lifeboat during the actual launching of this lifeboat from the Titanic? It is currently 2.05 a.m. on board the RMS Titanic, and at this late stage in the sinking, the Titanic's power levels have dropped so low that the Marconi wireless that is being used to broadcast the Titanic's distress call no longer functions. It's also at this time that the last lifeboat to leave the Titanic, Collapsible D, as seen in this animation, finally leaves the ship. And man, if you just take a look at this animation, you see how close the water is to the Titanic's boat deck and bridge. I mean, honestly, this really does go to show that the crew was literally working till the very last minute to try to get as many lifeboats as they could off of the Titanic before she sank. Now, Collapsible D actually has another interesting story that goes along with it right as soon as this lifeboat was leaving the Titanic. As you saw in that last animation, when Collapsible D touched the water, 
the water was very close to the Titanic's boat deck and bridge, being only one deck below. The water is right around here, right where my finger is, just on the deck below the boat deck. And when this lifeboat touched the water, it was right beside this part of the deck, with part of this deck already being submerged. And there were these two men who actually came out from inside the Titanic and saw Collapsible D getting ready to pull away from the Titanic. So what these two men did was they actually walked out onto a part of this deck, which is already submerged, right beside Collapsible D, and climbed over the Titanic's railing and got into this lifeboat before it left the ship. Now, on the boat deck above them, or on the deck right above them, Lightoller saw all this. He saw these two men come out of the ship, he saw them walk out onto a submerged part of the Titanic's deck, climb over the railing, and get into this lifeboat. And he didn't, but he almost ordered those two men to get off of that lifeboat and get back on the Titanic. He did decide to let them go, but he almost ordered them out. I mean, come on, Lightoller. I mean, at least you did let the men go, I will say that, but at this point, you know, there's empty seats in that lifeboat. These two men see the empty seats and they just climb into the boat. They're not threatening anybody. I don't get why you would even think for a moment to stop these two men from getting into the lifeboat. It is currently 2.09 a.m. on board the RMS Titanic. At this time on the ship, the wireless room is abandoned, so Jack Phillips and Harold Bride are now heading out, and collapsible lifeboat A, as seen in this animation, is pushed off of the roof of the officer's quarters down to the regular boat deck of the Titanic. Now, the reason the officers decided to push collapsible A off of the roof of the officer's quarters and down to the regular boat deck was because they wanted to attempt to launch this lifeboat the same way that they had launched all the other lifeboats throughout the sinking. They did not know at this time how close they were to the end of the Titanic's life. Now, once they pushed collapsible A off of the roof of the officer's quarters down to the boat deck, they began tying the lifeboat to the davits and, and beginning the process to correctly launch this lifeboat. However, as soon as the lifeboat hit the deck, at this late stage in the sinking, crowds were beginning to panic, and this lifeboat kind of got rushed with people. So people were already boarding this lifeboat before the lifeboat was even ready to be launched. And what these people didn't realize is that on the other side of the ship, hidden from view, the water was already beginning to itch its way up onto the boat deck. So the people who were working on Collapsible A really only had about one to two minutes left before the water reached them, and it would be too late to launch this lifeboat. It is now 2.10 a.m. on board the RMS Titanic, and at this time, this is when the last known sighting of Captain Smith and the Titanic's designer Thomas Andrews was reported. Right around this time, they were both seen on the Titanic's bridge, and Captain Smith said to Thomas Andrews, there's no sense in waiting any longer, she's going, it's time to go. Captain Smith and Thomas Andrews' last confirmed location was them jumping over the bridge wing of the Titanic as the bridge of the ship was beginning to submerge. Now, also around 2.10 a.m., this is the time frame in which it's believed the Titanic's band started playing Near My God 2D. We don't know the exact time frame in which it happened, but we do know it was somewhere around 2.10. Now, also around this time, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, the Titanic's two wireless operators, finally emerged from their cabin. I mean, the Titanic had stopped transmitting some five to ten minutes before, and only now did those two men finally come out of the wireless room and get out onto the boat deck. Now, in all the chaos that was beginning to start up on the Titanic's boat deck, Harold Bride lost Jack Phillips. Jack Phillips just disappeared into the crowd, and Harold Bride had no clue what happened to him. And while Harold Bride was looking around for him on the boat deck, something happened to Harold Bride that he did not expect. Around the time that Harold Bride was on the Titanic's boat deck looking for Jack Phillips, other members of the Titanic's crew were on the roof of the officer's quarters trying to push Collapsible B off of the roof and down to the boat deck. And as Harold Bride was on the Titanic's deck looking for Jack Phillips, they succeeded in pushing Collapsible B off of the roof of the officer's quarters and down to the boat deck, and it actually fell and landed upside down on top of Harold Bride. So essentially, he is now trapped underneath an upside down lifeboat on the rapidly sinking Titanic. Boy, I tell you, after hearing all this about Harold Bride, I mean, he had a time that night. I mean, think about it. He's watching his friend slowly losing his mind throughout the course of the evening. He fights off a random guy in the wireless room who's trying to steal his buddy's life jacket. He goes out onto the Titanic's boat deck, sees the ship rapidly sinking, loses his friend, and then on top of that, a lifeboat gets dropped on top of him and he gets stuck underneath it. And everyone, he never got out of there. He did eventually get out of that overturned lifeboat, but it wasn't until the Titanic sunk so far 
that the lifeboat literally floated off of him and he just swam out from underneath and climbed up on top of it. And Harold Bride would end up surviving the evening. I'm telling you, if you ask me, Harold Bride has one of the craziest survival stories of the entire Titanic disaster. Now that you know everything that's going on with collapsible lifeboat B on the Titanic's port side, let's head back over to the Titanic's starboard side and talk about collapsible A again. Remember how I told you earlier that they attempted to tie this lifeboat to the Titanic's davits and launch it just like all the other lifeboats? Well, by now they realize their mistake, and they realize that they did not have enough time to do this. However, this lifeboat is still tied to the Titanic's davits, and the ship is sinking so quickly at this point that it's threatening to drag this lifeboat down with the Titanic. They had to use knives and guns, whatever they had available, to free this lifeboat before the Titanic eventually took the lifeboat with it, and they did succeed in doing this. However, once this lifeboat was free, the Titanic's first funnel began to fall, missing collapsible B, the overturned lifeboat on the port side, by inches. Now, once the first funnel fell, it generated a huge wave that actually helped push collapsible A and B away from the Titanic before she went down. Now, with any new opening that exists in the Titanic's hull, whether it be from, you know, the windows breaking or the first funnel coming down, with any new opening in the hull, you are going to cause the sinking of the Titanic to just accelerate. Now, at this late stage in the sinking, there's not much you could do to make the ship sink any quicker than it already is, but still. With the first funnel gone, the Titanic was still going to slightly accelerate and begin to sink a little faster. Now, right around this time, water was beginning to rapidly flood inside of the Titanic's grand staircase. And for those of you who don't know, this rectangular structure you see right here in front of the second funnel, this is what housed the grand staircase dome. Now, as soon as this part of the Titanic was getting ready to go under where the Grand Staircase was, there was a man standing really close to it by the name of Archibald Gracie. And he said that right after the first funnel came down, a massive wave shot up over the boat deck and came over the Grand Staircase where he was. And in order to keep himself from being washed overboard, he grabs onto this railing and tries to hang onto the Titanic. But what he doesn't realize was that this wave wasn't a wave. It was that section of the ship dipping beneath the surface. So now he's holding onto a railing on a part of the Titanic that's already submerged. And he, then he said he felt this huge suction beginning to try to pull him underwater with the Titanic. And because he was standing right around this rectangular structure where the Grand Staircase Dome was, I believe that is evidence that the Grand Staircase Dome actually imploded and rapidly flooded just like we see in the James Cameron film. It is currently 2.15 a.m. on board the RMS Titanic, and at this time, the second funnel of the Titanic began to collapse, and when it fell, it erupted into a shower of sparks and fire, as described by a Titanic survivor by the name of Jack Thayer. There is a lot of debate to this day as to what could have caused the second funnel to erupt like this when it fell. Some people think it was coal dust igniting. I kind of think it might have had something to do with some boilers that were still inside the Titanic and pressurized, and they could have had a small-scale boiler explosion, which could have caused the second funnel to fall like this. But we will never know. It's a topic that is highly debated to this day. Now, right around the time that the Titanic's second funnel fell, this is also the time period at which the Titanic stern began to start rapidly climbing up and rising out of the water. And this is because at this late stage in the sinking, the whole bow section, which is now underwater, is essentially just dead weight that wants to drop to the bottom of the ocean. But at this point, the stern is still more or less 100% buoyant, and it's fighting the dead weight of the bow. So as the bow begins to drop lower and lower into the ocean, the stern is just rising up higher and higher, going with the bow, and the air inside the stern is preventing the stern from just dropping at this point. Now, all of this is putting a huge amount of strain on the Titanic's hull. And the only reason the stern doesn't, at this late stage, just go completely vertical is because of the Titanic's center of mass. You see, the Titanic's center of mass isn't the center of the ship. It's actually in between the third and fourth funnel where the heaviest object on the ship is, and that would be the Titanic's engines. And that's a big reason as to why the Titanic actually ended up floating for so long during the sinking. It's because the engines, where they were the heaviest things on the ship, they were actually counteracting the flooding in the Titanic's bow section throughout the entire sinking. So, if the Titanic had actually started sinking from the back instead of the front, the Titanic wouldn't have lasted an hour. With the weight of the incoming water and the weight of the Titanic's engines, the Titanic would just sink really quick. But because the Titanic flooded in the front section and the engines were in the back, 
it kind of created a stabilization effect, so to speak, keeping the Titanic on more or less an even keel until very close to the end of the sinking. But as the stern of the Titanic continues to climb higher and higher out of the water, this puts more and more strain on the Titanic's hull. Survivors of the Titanic disaster later said that once the ship reached this point in the sinking, it sounded like the ship was literally tearing itself apart. Survivors could literally hear the steel structure of the Titanic beginning to fail. And then finally at 2.19 a.m. it happened. Survivors of the Titanic's disaster said they heard what sounded like a very loud explosion and then they saw the stern of the Titanic settle back. What just happened was the Titanic suffered a massive structural failure and the entire ship broke in half. Now amazingly, just after the breakup, the Titanic's main power system did go out, but the Titanic's emergency generator did kick in, keeping a few emergency lights on in the stern section throughout the rest of the sinking. Now, when the Titanic broke in half, it didn't completely separate the bow section from the stern section. Essentially what happened was the entire structure of the ship from the front all the way down to nearly the bottom of the ship broke apart. You see, the bottom of the Titanic has a layer on it called the double bottom. It's this really strong part of the Titanic structure. The double bottom spans the entire length of the ship from the bow to the stern. And everything but the double bottom failed. So the double bottom is still holding the bow section to the Titanic stern section briefly after the breakup. We don't know exactly how long these two sections of the ship held together, but we do know it was a little bit after the breakup. Because right after the breakup, the Titanic stern settled back, but then as the bow continued to drop to the seafloor, the double bottom, at least briefly, began to pull the stern vertical. As I said, we don't know for how long, or we don't know how long the double bottom actually remained connected to the bow and stern, but we do know that it was long enough to allow the stern to at least begin to go vertical once the Titanic broke in half. And then at 2.20 a.m. on the morning of April 15th, 1912, two hours and 40 minutes after the collision with the iceberg, the Titanic stern, now going nearly completely vertical, begins to slip beneath the surface, taking 1,500 souls that are still on board the Titanic into the freezing cold North Atlantic Ocean. All right, everybody. Well, hey, I'm going to wrap up the video here. I just want to take a quick moment to thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this entire series that I've been working on on the entire story of the RMS Titanic. For all of you who have been watching this series from the first episode when the Titanic left Belfast to up to now with the Titanic finally slipping beneath the surface, I just wanted to thank you all for all your support. This was definitely the most ambitious project that I ever took on on this channel to date. And I just wanted to thank you all for coming on this ride with me and just enjoying my videos and just supporting what I do. It really, really means a lot, guys. Now, as I said earlier, I am going to crop all these videos together into one giant documentary film, so stay tuned for that. But yeah, guys, all right, well, hey, with Titanic Month coming to a close, before I say goodbye, I would like just to dedicate this video to all the victims who lost their lives on the night that the RMS Titanic went down. It's a very sad story, and I hope that we as a people, especially those who are really interested in the Titanic, I hope that we can learn a lot from the Titanic disaster, and we can move forward with the hope that something like that will never happen to anyone ever again. All right, everybody. Well, hey, thank you all so much for watching, and you all stay safe out there. All right, everybody. Well, hey, I'll see you in the next one. Have a good night, everybody.